Imagine you're walking up a flight of stairs. You slip and you fall, and you're trying to catch your fall with your arm, only to realize your arm isn't really there. It's an illusion. That happened to a patient I was talking to for a study. He had lost his arm years ago in an accident, but still, every day, all the time, it felt to him as if the arm was still there. It's what we call a phantom limb. Now, as he was falling, you would think that his brain would alert him to the fact that something is wrong and would tell him, you know, do something else, this isn't working. But instead, his brain tried to maintain this idea of a phantom arm and tried to reconcile it with reality. And so he had this very clear image in his mind of his arm going through the stairs as if they were water, and he fell flat on his face. These phantom limbs, the feeling that a limb is still there, they're fairly common after amputation, but still not everybody feels them. A lot of the people who do report them as being very painful. We've known about this phenomenon for quite some time. The first public figure to talk about it was British Admiral Lord Nelson in the 18th century. He had lost his arm in, uh, in a battle, and to him, his view was that his phantom sensations were providing him with direct evidence for the existence of an immortal human soul, because otherwise, how could the body still leave an impression after its destruction? Other people thought it was merely a psychological thing, like we cannot accept what has happened to our body, and so we fantasize about the limb being back again. So we had all these theories, but only in the last 25 years did we develop a piece of technology that allows us to look into the brain in a way that makes phantom limbs visible. I'm talking about functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI. I'm going to, I'm going to call it the brain scan from now on. Um, how does this work? I'm going to ask uh, you, for example, to come down to our lab, uh, be in the brain scanner, and do a simple hand movement like this. If you do that, the scanner allows me to pinpoint exactly where in your brain this movement is controlled and initiated. So it's going to light up as, a, as an area, as an active area on my screen. So I do that, and then I ask somebody else into the scanner, somebody who has lost their arm and perceives a phantom hand, and I ask them to do the exact same thing, but with their phantom hand. So they're in the scanner, they're moving their phantom hand, and keep in mind, there's no real movement going on. The person is lying perfectly still, uh, and yet, the brain scans that I took from you and from them will look very similar. In both cases, there will be clearly discernible activation in the area that controls hand movement. Now, crucially, if I ask somebody in the scanner who's been amputated but who does not perceive a phantom hand, this activation will not be there. So that means this activation is our first ever proof that phantom limbs exist. Think of it this way. You all know the story about uh, the tree falling in the forest and the question of whether or not it makes a sound, even, there's no, you know, even though there's nobody around to hear it. That question actually has sort of an answer. That tree is certainly uh, going to cause pressure waves in the air, which are what usually convey sound to us, but without a brain around to interpret them, there's not going to be the experience of sound. In this example, the phantom limb is like these pressure waves, intangible, until, un un unless it's interpreted by a brain. And the scanner becomes like placing a recording device in the forest. So suddenly we can collect a record, an objective proof, uh, and we can talk about this and we can investigate it. But how does it work in the brain? Like, how can the brain experience something, feel something that just doesn't exist? Well, spoiler alert, the full story is not in yet. Uh, we're still debating about the details, but I can, still, I can already talk to you uh, about a fair bit uh, that we do know. So let's go back to the idea of, who was it? You lying in the scanner and doing the, uh, the hand movement. So the area that controls this hand movement is right around here. It's one spot, a cluster of cells, uh, more or less right below your skull on the surface of your brain. Right next to that is the spot that controls mouth movement. So that's going to be active for me right now because I'm talking to you. And then there's, you know, the area for leg movement around and so forth. So basically what I could do is I could uh, put you in the scanner, we could do all these movements, and afterwards I could basically, you know, take you out, open up your skull, uh, take a pen, and I, I'm not going to do that. It's just, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to make a point. You know, everybody's like, well, what exactly did I sign up for here? But uh, what I could do is I could draw a little hand over the hand region, a little mouth over the mouth region of your brain, and I would end up with a complete drawing of a small person on the surface of your brain. Because every part of your body that you can move is represented in your brain. Now, this person, this drawing would look a bit odd because, again, the mouth is right next to, uh, to the hand and the proportions are off but it's going to be an entire map of your body. 
And in fact, it's not the only map of your body that you have in your brain. You have a couple of them. For example, there's a whole other one just to process touch. So the question now becomes, what happens to all of these maps, all of these representations, if the shape of your body drastically changes, for example, after amputation? Well, first of all, there's going to be a, a number of brain cells with nothing to do because they're waiting for signals that will never come from limbs that don't exist anymore. Uh, brain cells hate this kind of boredom. So, you know, they might sit around, they might look around what the neighbors are doing, and one of those cells that used to represent your hand might look at the neighbor who represents the lip and so might start doing whatever they are doing, and as, an, as a result, these maps might shift around as cells are being reassigned new tasks. So here's the thing. Using fMRI brain imaging, we can measure the degree of this shift, the degree of this organization. Uh, and in fact, it was my PhD mentor back in Germany who found out that the amount of this shift directly relates to the severity of phantom limb pain, which means the more your brain reorganizes itself after amputation, the more painful your phantom limb will be. But even if we accept that phantom limbs exist, isn't it you know, even weirder that they can hurt? Like, how can that be? Because Usually we would think of pain as something that's just an automatic reaction to injury, right? Like switching on the light. Uh, but phantom limb pain tells us that there can be pain without injury. We also know that there can be injury without pain. We know stories from soldiers on the battlefield who sometimes sustain severe injuries and sometimes don't feel any pain, presumably because their brain has something more important to do at the time. So pain is not objective the same injury can cause different degrees of pain depending on the context, depending on whether you're on the battlefield, you're in a good mood, you're in love, all kinds of stuff. That's also the reason why there will never be an objective pain scale, like uh, a bee sting hurts as much as two slaps in the face or something like that. It has been tried, but it's never going to be successful because it's not objective, because our brain doesn't just report back what's happening, it has to interpret what's going on, and only what's real to our brain is what is real for us. The same thing is true for other topics as well. The taste of food, for example, changes depending on context. That's why it's so hard to recreate that great meal from your last trip to Italy, because even if you recreate the meal perfectly down to its last, the last molecule of its com uh, chemical composition, it might not have the same taste because there's other stuff coming into it. Uh, you, you know, you're at home, you're not in Italy, you didn't just spend a great day hiking, you don't have the same live music. All of that can influence the taste of your food. In a similar way, the same story, the same experience, will be remembered differently depending on whether you were hungry or scared or angry as it occurred. That's why it's so vitally important to take any eyewitness accounts in court with a grain of salt. So here's the amazing thing that ties all of these strands together. If I were to uh, do a brain scan in any of these situations, in any, in any situation where there is a divide between objective reality and your subjective experience, the activation in your brain will always side with the subjective experience, not with objective reality, because only what's real to your brain is what is real to you. Now, if that sounds a bit abstract, I have, a, I have a, an example for you. There is a body illusion called the cutaneous rabbit illusion, and it works like this. I'm going to tap your skin two times, like this, and if I do it just right in terms of the location, in terms of the timing, it's going to feel like three taps to you. Uh, it's an illusion that's based on the way our nerves interpret what's going on in the skin. This has been done in the scanner as well. And what you see if you do that is three distinct locations of activation. So for our brain, this third tap exists. On the skin, it does not. So where does that leave us in terms of the question of what's real and what's not real? Is that third tap real? Not really, right? It's, it's an illusion. Uh, I don't care if it you know, pops up on a brain scan, it's still an illusion. But if that's true, then the phantom limb is also just an illusion. And I mean, if it's an illusion, it's a pretty powerful one. We can feel it, we can, we can measure it, we can use it in pain therapy, which is what I did as a study when I talked to that patient in the beginning. Um, it's, it's real to us, it's real as it happens. Is pain real? Of course pain is real, everybody knows that. I mean, sure, it's generated by your brain and as it interprets reality, but that doesn't mean that we can ignore it or change it or forget about it. And in fact, that leads us to a misconception that we have. If we say, oh, something's, you know, that's all in your head or that's just in your mind, that's our way of saying it's not real, you can ignore it. And that's a very bad misconception. That's a misconception that hurts people uh, because there are people out there, there's chronic pain patients out there 
who are physically completely healthy, but their brain registers pain all the time. And they have trouble being taken seriously by society, they have trouble getting the right diagnosis, because we have this myth in our minds that our brain just sits back and reports to us whatever's going on in reality. But phantom limb pain tells us that that's not the case. Phantom limb research tells us that our brain needs to interpret what's going on in reality. It might do so you know, imperfectly, and we have to rely on this interpretation of reality, flawed as it may be, because it becomes our new reality. But then where do we go from here? What can we do about this? Um, I can give you three pieces of, not even advice, but of a take-home message of, of consequences out of this that I think are important. First of all, we should always question our own beliefs, our own perceptions, um, regardless you know, of the context, whether it's, it's the taste of food or you know, whatever, um, because it might be flawed. It might not be what, what reality is. Second of all, wherever we can, we should try to use critical thinking and the scientific method to find out what's actually going on in reality. That's what we developed science for, to kind of overcome this flawed perception of reality. And the third one is the most important one, I think. If it's true that each of us has their own reality about all kinds of things, about things as basic as whether something is hurtful, about as, you know, things as basic as the shape of our body, and all of us, each of us has this you know, specific reality for our own, and they are all equally flawed, then I think that's a great reason to go out there and approach people with as much understanding and openness and tolerance as we can. Because something that is absolutely 100% real for us might be something that's not real for them. Thank you for your time.